Okay. All right. Thank you. I am an alcoholic and my name is Pat and I am so thrilled to be here. I, he said, would you like to speak sometime? And I said, sure. And then um, I didn't hear from you. I was like, that's okay. Because I find this very intimidating. I'm a behind the scenes person. I like to, um, I like to stay behind the scenes. I like, I was told to that I should always do clean up and set up and wash ashtrays and coffee pots and that that's where I should stay because I didn't need to be out front. And I got very comfortable doing that and working with women in this program. So I wanna thank, um, I wanna thank the Serenity Improvement Group. Um, it was great to, to finally get down there and go to a brick and mortar meeting on Friday at noon and then to be able to attend the roundup. So that's what I got to meet everybody. Um, and thank you all for um, allowing me this time out of your day. And uh, and so the, um, I guess I'll say that I'll start with, I got sober in Houston. So the way we used to introduce ourselves is by the grace of God and the help of Alcoholics Anonymous and all of you, I have not found it necessary to pick up a drink or a substitute since January 15th of 1978. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. I have to tell you, um, that is a tribute to Alcoholics Anonymous in God. That is not a tribute to me, I can tell you that. Um, I will, um, I'm, I'm a pretty solid AA, um, what do you call it? I like traditional AA. I'm, I haven't changed much since I got sober in 78. I like the way that it was set up and, um, and, um, and it's very comfortable. I don't like change anyhow. John the Indian used to say, we, we alcoholics climb in our rut and then we decorate them. And that's the way I feel. Um, I'll just say that, you know, I, I was, did not have a long drinking history. My alcoholism went very, very fast. But I would tell you that when I was a young girl, when I was very little, I was, uh, I was, I had all the isms. I just hadn't, in, you know, I had not ingested the, uh, the fluid yet. I was a liar, a cheat, and a thief from the time I could remember. You know, I used to steal stuff out of my mother's pockets. I used to steal out of my brother's um, paper money. If my, you know, if they asked me if I had done something, what came flying out of my mouth like a spring reaction was, no, I didn't do it, you know? And then I lived in my own delusional world. Um, I always thought there was something wrong with me and there was always something different and not. And, and, and it's true, you know, people used to say to me all the time, what is wrong with you? And, you know, I didn't know what was wrong with me, but I was profoundly broken from the time that I was a little girl. And I know now, I believe that I was, you know, born an alcoholic. I all they had to do was put the liquid in me and then I could, you know, then that was my solution. It was always going to be my solution until I came to this program. Um, I picked up my first drink when I was on my first date. I was 15 years old. Somebody had, had, me, had asked me out. It was going to be a double date and uh, we had to make a run. I grew up in Maine and we had to make a run to uh, this town in this little, you know, general store called Chucky's and we got our beer and um and I drank and it was it did for me what it, exactly what it was supposed to do it went down to my toes it went up through my head it exploded and I thought oh my god this is wonderful and for the first time I felt comfortable unfortunately I ended the evening by getting very drunk and throwing up and you know I was just you know, it didn't even bother me. That was the problem. I thought this was great. I enjoyed the evening. I couldn't wait to go on another date. And, um, and that's, you know, that was the beginning of my drinking. I, uh, I felt, I felt, I have a friend that I got sober with in Houston. He got sober before me. And he used to say that when he took a drink, the pimples on his face went to his ass and he was pretty. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but that's what happened to me. I was an ugly, gawky little girl. I had an older sister who was just gorgeous and everybody wanted to have her at their house. And, um, and so when I put a drink in me, I thought I was Kathy. That's what I did, you know? I could be social and pretty and, you know, um, and do all the things that I thought she felt comfortable doing. Um, and so, you know, 
it was funny because I, I was on my, um, I always used to go to my high school class reunions and somewhere along the line, somebody said to me, you drank, a, you drank so much in high school. You were really a drinker in high school. And I thought, how insulting. I can't believe you said that to me. Yet I was like sober in this program. And I thought, I can't believe that they're saying that to me. Why would I not think that? I was a drinker in high school. All the parties were at our house. You know, I remember the, um, the principal had to put a, go come over the loudspeaker and say, no one is allowed to go to the party at the loose house. You know, oh, and I'm thinking, I can't even believe they said that. Um, because we were having a band exchange concert and I was in the band. So all the band members were coming to our house. That's what we thought. But nobody was allowed to come to our house because it was known as a party house. Um, you know, so I will. I'll, um, so I drank when I could. That's what I did. And it never took a lot to get me drunk. Um, I grew up and I'm going to tell you, I grew up in an alcoholic home, but that has nothing to do with my alcoholism. Maybe it made me a little worse for wear. But, um, you know, we were a typical Catholic Irish family, you know, everybody got together, everybody drank, and then the fights began. And that's what happened in our house. You know, there was some place in the step book that says, and the dining room furniture ended up in the living room. And I remember the night that that happened in our house. But on the outside, it looked terrific. Um, my parents were, you know, they were really good people. Um, they were incredibly um, hardworking and they were successful and they were very generous and they did a lot for the community but you know they were just alcoholics and that was you know the way our life went and when I was 14 years old my father committed suicide as a result of this disease and um, he was 50 years old and 10 years later when I was two years sober my mother died of alcoholism and um, and you know and I don't I don't think that they caused my alcoholism I just think that it was just in, in our family and, and in us, and it was in me. You know, and out of four ki six kids, um, two of us were alcoholic, and the rest were very sick al -Anons, you know? Um, you know, when I was 17 years old, my husband was getting ready to go into the army and go to flight school. And, you know, I, I fell for the line, you know? He was a year ahead of me, and I ended up pregnant. And here I was, Miss High School. I was class president. I was yearbook editor. I was, I was Miss Priss. That's what I thought. I was, I acted very prissy and very conservative. Um, but what they didn't know is they didn't know me when I went home and, at, and when I went out at night, you know, and that was the way my pattern was. I would go to a job, put on my little corporate suit um, and go and act like I was very conservative and I was um, very innocent. And then I would go home at night and change my clothes and hit the streets. Um, so I did get, I got, I had a baby at 17 and my husband was in Vietnam and um, I could, when he went, when he went to Vietnam, what I knew, what I know now and I didn't know then was I finally had no restraints on me and I could drink the way that I wanted and I could party the way that I wanted. And that's what I did. You know, I, um, I was not a good wife while he was in Vietnam. I wasn't good to my in-laws when they came to visit because I was, um, I, I really treated them disrespectfully. A couple of guys that were good friends of my husband's, you know, I was, I hung out with them. And, um, and you know, drinking got me in trouble while I was in that marriage. And, uh, and when he came back from Vietnam, he, only part of him came back, you know, he had gotten involved in drugs. He was, he was a pilot, but he, um, but he had picked up not only drinking, but drugs while he was there. And um, not all of him came home. And, um, our marriage did not last. It was very violent. And, uh, and when he took off and left me, you know, I, um, you know, I was very, I worked really hard. Um, but I did things that, you know, and I say this for the women in, that I share with, um, I was one of those mothers that left my child at home at four and five and six years old. You know, I would say, I've got to, I just have to run out for a minute. I'll be right back. I'll just be right back. Just lock the door and don't, don't answer it. And, you know, I meant to come right back. I really did. But, um, you know, I didn't come right back until the bar stopped, you know, when the, when the um, lights came on at the bar and they had done last call and it was two in the morning and I would go home and my son was there by himself. Um, you know, and I, I got, 
you know, I, at this point I lived in, when I left Maine and got married, I, I went to Texas and, um, and that's where I spent a lot of time. And that's where most of my drinking took place. Um, you know, I did all the things that people do, you know, we'd go to the cow pastures and look in the cow patties and we were looking for, you know, whatever they find in the cow pastures in the cow patties. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I did stuff, you know, um, people thought that I was this very straight laced, um, girl and and that's what I looked like and that's the image that I projected and as I said you know um I would come home and I would change my clothes and I would hit the streets um because now I was single my husband left me and and now I could party the way I wanted prior to that I would focus on him it was all about him and his drinking my parents drinking my father's drinking my family's drinking um and I and I did a lot of I went to counseling about that and I would want to talk about all these people in my life who had just, um, I, was, I was a martyr and I was a blamer and I didn't take responsibility for anything. It was all everybody else's fault. And, um, uh, and, and those therapists wanted to talk about me and I couldn't believe, you know, I was like, I want to, you know, and I did, I did Al-Anon during that time. And I remember they were going to have a, um, they were going to have a joint Al-Anon and AA dance. And my sister and I thought that was hysterical because they were going to have a party without drinking. And we couldn't even imagine that that was going to happen. Um, and then, of course, obviously, we didn't go to the dance. We went off and we partied. Um, you know, I, um, I worked a lot of jobs um, because I was trying to support my son. And, um, and I, did, you know, I did stupid stuff. Like, you know, I would buy a pound of pot and clean it and then sell it so that I wouldn't have to, so I could have my own. And somebody said, you're a drug dealer. And I said, I am not a drug dealer. I'm just trying to, you know, I don't want to take any money out of my son's mouth, you know? So, um, and, you know, and I have to tell you that the fact that I would even do that in the state of Texas during the seventies was unbelievable because people were going to jail for having one ounce or having one joint. You could drink all you want, but you were not going to have drugs. Um, and, um, you know, I did a lot of things that I didn't want to do. I had, you know, I had good values and good morals. That's what I thought, but I could not live up to them when I was drinking. You know, if, um, if you invited me to your house, I was in your medicine cabinet. I was looking through to see what you might have. Um, if you didn't offer me, uh, alcohol or the condiments that went, you know, the other stuff, the drugs, then I would leave and go to somebody else's house. And I found out, you know, in sobriety, really what I was, was I was a user. You know, I used and abused people for what I could get from them. And, and that's not the way that I thought about myself. I thought I was just wonderful, you know? And I had a sister that lived with me. I convinced her to come from Maine to, to Houston. And she lived with me rent-free. And, and we partied a lot together. And then one day she told me she was moving. She was moving out of my apartment where she lived rent free and she was moving into her own apartment where she was going to have to pay rent. And I couldn't, number one, she was a great babysitter. So that when I went out and I, you know, I'm like, why, why are you moving? And she said, it's too painful to live around you. You know, that should have told me something. And I didn't understand what she was saying. Um, and I didn't understand what she meant, but you know, um, you know, things happened to me um, like I, you know, I woke up with people that I didn't know. I'll just say that I, I, I try, I tried to, um, <laughs> I wasn't really good at some of my jobs. I remember I tried to kind of have my own little business going nightlife as like an escort or something. I didn't know what I was doing. And the problem was I forget to ask for the money, you know? And so I figured that, that was not my, not, not my, um, my cup of tea. Um, the, uh, the end of my drinking um, was that I was losing, I was, I was losing jobs because I was lying. I wasn't getting to work. Um, I will tell you that I lived in an apartment that was roach infested. I moved all the time in Houston, always to, I thought to a better apartment, but really what was happening is it was going downhill. Um, it was roach infested. I didn't have any furniture. I had boxes that I used for tables. Um, my car had the whole passenger side was crushed in. I had to open the hood and shake the wires to get it going. 
Um, me, who was a clothes horse, I loved clothes. I had three outfits and um, I would pick them off the floor to figure out what I was going to work, where to work the next day. I was just, I was just a mess. I was a mess. And, um, you know, and, and the same old questions that people would say to me, what's wrong with you? You know, that was the biggest question that people would always say to me, what is wrong with you? And I never knew what was wrong with me. Um, and at the, um, the end of my drinking, um, I, you know, I would wake up in the morning and I would think, why am I awake? I would pray to God that I wouldn't wake up, that I would just wake up dead. I didn't want to kill myself. I just didn't want to wake up anymore. I was 26 years old. I did not think that life was fun. I thought it was hard. I was just tired. And I knew my sister would be a better parent than I was. And by the way, I had just gotten married again. You have to, the one thing I'll say to you is I like weddings and I like to have nice big weddings. And I remember when my family said to me, we're not coming to any more weddings. You know, they, I would, I had my first wedding and I, and I planned it at 17. Then I got married again. Somebody, a guy, you know, that I was seeing said, you want to get married? And I said, yes. And then I couldn't figure out how to say no. So at the, you know, I, at the uh, back of St. Anne's Catholic Church in Houston, smoking a joint, trying to, you know, walking down the aisle with tears coming down my face. And people thought they were tears of joy, but it was tears of misery. I didn't want to get married. I didn't, I mean, he was a nice guy, but I didn't want to have the marriage, but I couldn't figure out when I made a decision, how to say, how to change that decision. Um, so um, I got to, uh, you know, so anyhow, at the end of my drinking, I just, I just didn't want to wake up anymore. I really didn't. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I'd been everywhere. I had been to, I'd been to a Cuban witch doctor. I had been to a reader of the cards. I had been to a psychic. I was, had gone to therapy. I had, um, oh yeah, I knocked on the priest's door at 1130 for midnight mass on Christmas Eve, you know, and just begged him to please hear my confession. I thought if I did a really good confession, maybe something would change. I was just desperate because I, I just, I just had had enough and I didn't, I just didn't want to be there anymore. Um, and the last thing that happened to me was I was in New Orleans and I decided that I, uh, well, I uh, actually it was Jan December 31st of 77 and I decided maybe I shouldn't drink anymore. My family was filled with alcoholism. And I should probably be a good Al-Anon and not drink anymore. So I was going to make a resolu resolution not to drink. And I had a wonderful friend who was a business associate. And I had said to him, I'm not going to drink anymore. And he said, oh, then maybe you'd like to come to New Orleans with us. They were going to go to New Orleans. They were going to see the King Tut exhibit. And I didn't have the money to go. And he was going to um, be my benefactor and and fly me there and pay for my hotel and go, you know, I was going to be with business associates. And, um, and he said, you know, the only reason I'm going to invite you and pay for this trip for you is because you're not drinking. Um, and I had been asked out of his home prior to that, because he told me never to come to his home when I was drinking, when his kids were there. And, you know, I showed up at that door and his kids were there and he had to throw me out of his house. And that wasn't the only place I was thrown out of. I was thrown out of a lot of people's houses. They did not want me at their house. They'd say, there's a party and please don't tell her. You know, um, one time my boss got called into the, um, the president of the corporation's office. And he said, was that Pat Bean that I saw on the 10 o'clock news last night being hauled off in a paddy wagon? And he didn't, you know, and you know what? That was me. That was me. Right on the 10 o'clock news, you know, I had, um, I caused a lot of problems at that company. And I caught, almost caused other people jobs because I was a nightmare. If I, if I came to your house at two in the morning, I was a nightmare. If I came to your house at eight o'clock at night, I was a nightmare. You know, I just showed up where I wasn't wanted. Um, but so I went on this trip to New Orleans and what happened to me was Southwest Airlines <laughs> was flying to New Orleans and they used to offer little bottles of wine. And so you could have little bottles of wine on the plane. And when we got to New Orleans, um, I took that little bottle of wine right off that plane. And somebody said to me, why are you bringing that wine with you? And I said, because if somebody comes to my room while in, in New Orleans, I'd like to offer them a drink. 
I knew no one in that city, you know, and I just, you know, and I, and I, it's so interesting to me, my, I was so delusional and the book uses the word delusional, you know, I was so delusional. I believed what I was saying. I didn't intentionally do a lot of lies, you know, and make up stories, but I, because I believed what I was saying, you know, I just lived in that world of my own and I made up a lot of stuff. And sometimes I knew I was lying and sometimes I didn't. But anyhow, we got to New Orleans and I don't know what happened, but boy, I'm, I guess I'm happy that this was the way that my last drunk appeared because I picked up a drink and I don't remember picking up a drink. You know, I somehow found myself drunk and, um, and I will tell you that my host was not really happy with me because they were, it was miserable and it was raining that weekend and they were going back to the room and nobody was talking to me. And I said, well, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to continue to go. I think I said I was going to go visit a friend that I knew at, a, at some establishment. I didn't know anybody, but what I needed to do was I needed another drink and I needed to go back and stay on, you know, Bourbon Street and finish what I had started because I, um, that's what I had to do. And when I got back to that hotel room, I caused such a scene. Um, you know, I banged on doors. I couldn't find my key. I, I don't, couldn't remember what room I was in, you know. And, uh, and I have to tell you, it was a very silent flight back to Houston because no one was talking to me. And, and, um, and that, was the, that was my last drunk. But then, you know, I would love to tell you that I went to AA, but I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I just, I, that was not anything that entered my mind. And probably I had always said, I never want to be like my mother. And what I know now is I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I would rather have gone to a mental institution and been locked up than to have to admit that I was an alcoholic. Um, so for the next three months, I didn't drink and I didn't go to AA and I didn't do anything. And I was absolutely stark raving sober, I mean, dry. I was a nutcase. I was an emotional wreck. I was depressed. Um, and, you know, one day I woke up and I thought, I'm just going to kill myself. That's what I need to do. My sister will be a better mother to my son than I could be. And, and I, and if you know my, if you knew the um, relationship that I had with my mother, it was not a good relationship at all. We had a horrible relationship. And, you know, by the grace of God, I said, kill myself or go see my mother. You know, and that was a tough decision because both of them were like, it was just unacceptable. But somehow I had no money. I had, I don't even, I had no business asking my company for any kind of um, consideration because they had just seen me on the news a few months before that. Um, and I don't know what happened, but I think it was the grace of God. They loaned me money to have a flight to fly home to Maine to see my mother. and. You know, by the grace of God, my mother was in AA. She struggled with going in and out of this program for seven years and didn't make it. But I will tell you, I got to that. I got to Brunswick, Maine, and she said to me, would you like to go home and get freshened up and, because I'm going to an AA meeting? And I said, oh, no, I'll go to your AA meeting. I think this is very good what you guys are trying to do for yourselves. And that was, that was the arrogance of an alcoholic. But I went to that meeting with her that night. And a young girl got up at the podium and absolutely told my story. And for the next um, five or six nights, we, went, we were in a meeting every single night. And I was there as a good Al-Anon daughter should have been. <laughs> and, I was, I, and I had to go back to that town and do meetings after I got sober. And they reminded me of, um, of how arrogant I was and how um, condescending I was about what they were trying to do for their lives. And I was really happy they were going to clean up their lives. Um, and it was my life that needed to be cleaned up. Um, I flew back to Houston thinking that's what a vacation should be. I felt so good. And I never connected it to the fact that I wasn't drinking, but I had been in a meeting every single night. And I grabbed my husband of the moment. And I said, oh, you're an alcoholic. You need to go to AA. So that very night, we went to a meeting in downtown Houston, and a um, young couple picked us up. I, I'll never forget this. They picked us up and said, would you like to go for coffee? And I, we said, oh, yeah, we'll go for coffee after the meeting. So we went to coffee, and um, 
the funny part was I was the one asking all the questions and I knew my husband was like waiting to get out of there. He could not stand the meeting. He did not want to be with those people. And he probably couldn't wait to get home and pick up, you know, another bottle of scotch. But um, in every night for seven nights, this couple said, okay, tomorrow night, we're going to meet you here. And then they would tell me where to go and they would meet me at the meeting and then they would take us out for coffee. And at the end of seven nights, they said, now, you know, where there's a meeting every single day and, you know, go or stay, it's up to you. And, um, you know, we went home that night and my husband picked up a bottle of scotch and the next night I went to another meeting. And that was the beginning of my journey of, you know, I think we, we had like a 30 day marriage. I think that was something like that. I mean, we had obviously been married longer than that, but our marriage effectively lasted about 30 days. And, uh, and that was the beginning of my journey. And I will be forever grateful that I got in with a group of people. I called them like they were old. They were really old codgers. That's what I called them. They were like in their 40s and their 50s. <laughs> I was thinking, oh my God, these guys are so old. But I, um, I started going to meetings at the Houston Western Group in Bel Air and um, and Post Oak, and I loved the fact that there were clubs and I could go to meetings all the time. And the one, you know, at that point, I still was introducing myself as an Al-Anon. I would go in and I would so proudly say, and I'm Pat and I'm an Al-Anon, you know, and they would just say, you just keep coming. You just keep coming. Um, and, but I loved it. I loved it in AA. I didn't want to be the alcoholic and I, and I didn't want to admit that I was, but I felt safe for the first time probably in a long time. And I felt at home for the first time in my life. That's the truth. I went into that meeting and I just loved being there. It just for one hour, I was safe and I was, I could just breathe. And, um, and I actually didn't want to go home. I would go to coffee. I didn't know you, I didn't know everybody could go for coffee. I used to, for a while, I would say, how come nobody invites me to go for coffee? That's what I said in my head. And finally, I asked somebody, he said, nobody ever invites me to come to Kip's for coffee. And she, he goes, nobody invites anybody. We just all show up. And uh, so I started going and I was one of those hanger honors. I would stay at that coffee shop because I didn't want to go home. I just didn't want to go home. I didn't trust going home. I was lonely. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't. I was full of fear. And you took away my solution. You know, when I stopped drinking, my solution was gone and I didn't know how to live. I had no clue how to live without alcohol. Um, that was what gave me my fortitude. It's, you know, you know, I, even though I never, I couldn't drink a lot. I drank on weekends. That was my pattern. And the only reason that it was, is because I had wicked hangovers. I would do a little pot smoking during the week to keep my nerves on. I would take, I was, I was, I liked diet pills. I would take pills in the morning, get myself going. I would smoke a joint to get myself you know, ready for bed as I slept on the couch. And then I would throw my blankets in the um, closet in the morning. Um, and then I would, you know, then I would go out and party on the weekends. And I just, I have to say this um, because it is a warning for me. When I, um, when I would hit the streets and I love, I love bars. That's where I drank. And I liked sleaze bars. And I liked, there's a part of me right through my middle that says, I just love sleaze. That's what it is. And when I start getting attracted to sleaze, I know that I'm in trouble and I'm off the spiritual beam because it just draws me in. Um, and uh, when I wasn't a home drinker, I just, I, well, I had to, I had to have a few drinks to get ready to go out. But, um, but anyhow, so that would begin my journey in AA. And I will tell you that, um, I am forever grateful for those people in those meetings. You know, they would, they told me, you know, 90 meetings in 90 days. And in Houston or in that part of the country, you can't speak in a meeting until you have 90 days. And, and that was great for me because I would have been sitting there planning what I was going to say. And I never would have heard the message. And I, heard, <laughs> I had this one friend, Wayne Gilbert. And he stood up in one of those meetings and he said, I have something to say. And his sponsor took him by the belt and shoved him down and said, shut up. You don't have anything to say. You don't have 90 days yet. And I thought, I am never going to do that. I'm never going to stand up. Um, and I thought that they were very rude to me. They didn't know how sensitive I was. And I had a running thing in my head 
that when I got sober enough, I was going to tell them what I thought of them. And I just, you know, and it was funny because in the meantime, I did everything they told me to do. They told me to go to all these meetings. I went to a meeting. I probably went to eight to probably 10 to 12 meetings a week. And you could do that because it was, it was a club, you know, and I have to say my poor son, you know, he probably, you know, he spent a lot of time alone and that's just the truth. Um, and that was, uh, and I, and I, you know, I certainly regret that, but I don't regret the fact that I, I got sober finally because he would have probably ended up with living with my sister because I would have killed myself. And today he's very happy that I am sober. Um, so um, I went to a lot of different meetings and that's what they told me to do. I tried, it was interesting because I decided I was, these people were too old and I was going to go to young people's meetings. So I started kind of veering out and I did get a sponsor and I had a job in a group and they said, um, I will just say this. I said to my sponsor, because they were going to nominate people for jobs. And I said, can you nominate me for the chairman? <laughs> I don't know. I was only months sober. And, and I had actually had a, a gay man as my first sponsor and Terry raised his hand and he said, Pat would like to do cleanup. And I thought he just didn't hear me. He didn't hear me. And he said to me, you don't ever need to be out front. You stay on cleanup and set up and coffee maker. You and do not go out front because your pride and your ego do not need it. I thought, I can't believe you're so rude to me. But I have to tell you, I've been treasurer once and I had all the IOUs in that coffee can. So I never was treasurer again. And I've never been secretary. I've never been a greeter. I've never done chips, you know. And I and I've held to that all these years of. I needed to stay behind the scenes. And my best resentments have been built in the kitchens of AA. Um, while I was sitting there cleaning up that kitchen and they were all going out to coffee and I was left behind. <laughs> what the, I can't believe they're leaving and I have to clean up this kitchen. Um, but I also know that, and I, but when I left that kitchen, it was the cleanest kitchen um, that they would ever find. And I was so excited that they trusted me enough to, um, to give me a key to the club. And, and that was amazing to me that um, I will tell you my little running down the hallway story. Um, when I was about six months sober and I still was having a hard time deciding if I was an alcoholic, they would say to me, well, don't leave until you're hundred percent sure you are an alcoholic or you're hundred percent sure you're not. And every time I would think, I'm out of here, I'm out of here. I just had emotional problems. I would have grown up eventually. Um, maybe I just have mental problems and I don't belong here. And then that, boy, that voice would come booming into my head that said, are you 100% sure? And I wasn't. Um, but one night they had probably um, hurt my feelings one more time. You know, they probably told me the truth because they had a habit of saying, I love you enough to tell you the truth and not worry about your feelings. And I, and I, I worry about more about your life. Um, and somebody had probably hurt my feelings one more time. And I went storming out of that meeting. I'm like, I am out of here. And I went, and I remember walking down that hallway. I was running down the hallway on the second floor of that office building where the Houston Western club had their, their rooms. And you know what I was really doing? I was like, this is what I was waiting for. Pat, Pat, come back, come back. I was waiting for somebody to run down that hallway and grab me and tell me to please, please come back. And what they did was they actually closed the door and started the meeting. And I got to the end of that hallway and, and what, you know, and I looked at that stairwell and I thought, if I go down those stairs, I'm dead. I will pick up a drink and I will be dead. The alternative was to go back, you know, put my tail between my legs and go back into that room. And, um, I was like, I was, I was pissed. I was like, I, you know, I needed to be broken. I needed my, you know, I, my pride needed to be smashed because I was not as teachable as I needed to be. Um, and I, and I just, I needed to make a decision about where I really wanted to be. Did I want to be out in that world or did I want to be sober and have a life and follow this program the way it was laid out. And so I, you know, I walked back in that room and I always get emotional when I say this, you know, I walked, I opened the door, I walked in the room, somebody put a cup of coffee on the table and said, welcome back. 
And that is, you know, that's the love of one alcoholic for another. And I always get emotional and I almost always cry when I say that um, because it was just the grace of God. Every little thing that happened, I could just, you know, I look back and I see God's hand in it. Um, I'm a huge believer in that there, there are three legacies in this program. There's fellowship, when there's unity, recovery, and service. And I have to be in all three of those places. I have to be in recovery. I have to be in service. Um, and I have to be in the fellowship. And I have ebbed and flowed with that over the years. I, um, I thought I could save my husband. And I chased and chased and chased him. Um, he, um, he, he, could, he could stay sober for a while. This is, by the way, I got married a couple more times just to let you know, but I had nice weddings. So <laughs> I always like very nice weddings. <laughs> and, um, but I remarried my first husband. That was the first mistake. Um, and not really, but love of my life. But, you know, um, he couldn't stay sober. He could not stay sober. And, you know, and I did a lot of things. Houston used to tell me, if you want to know whether or not you're doing the right thing, find out if you want that action that you're doing or that behavior posted at the uh at the cinema on the big screen or if it's going to be on the front page of the of the houston post and those were good barometers for me and if i didn't want to tell this is what i would do i wouldn't tell my sponsor until afterward you know and that was also a sign you know um i have um i believe in going through the big book and doing the steps through the big book the way it's laid out I believe that service is even more than just helping. And, you know, I think service work is making coffee. It is going to commitments. It is going to treatment centers. I did five years of going to Concord Prison here in Massachusetts and took a meeting in every Friday night for five years until they told me I couldn't anymore because I was like nine and a half months pregnant. And they said, we don't have a maternity ward here. It's the men's prison. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, but I have always had a job in AA. Um, I believe that that is critical for me. I have listened to people. Um, I've had, um, I've gone without uh, sponsors. You know, my sponsor died several years ago. Well, a few years ago, four or five, six years ago. And I did what was, you know, a really stupid thing. I decided to be my own advisor. And that is not, it's like having an attorney that you're going to represent yourself. Um, I, it is not a good idea. I'm also somebody who, um, so I looked around for a sponsor and I have to say, it did matter to me. I wanted somebody who had more sobriety than me. It just psychologically, it made a difference for me. And I wanted somebody who believed in going through the steps of the big book. Um, and I finally, it took me, and this is so funny, at all these years sobriety, it took me six months to ask her, you know, I kept talking to her and saying, so I finally got a new sponsor, which I'm so happy about because I, you know, but I've always done my readings in the morning. I have, um, I sponsor women in this program. Um, I, I, it is an honor and a privilege to take people through the steps, but I also think there's other ways to give back. It's not the only way, you know, there are other jobs in this, in this fellowship to keep it going. You know, if we don't have a place for meetings and, and the pandemic was, was amazing, you know, so many meetings don't have places today. You know, a lot of places stopped having AA up here. I don't know about down there, but in Massachusetts, a lot of the churches didn't take AA back into their into their halls because of whatever reason. So we've we've struggled trying to find places to have our meetings. And um, I believe in in-person meetings. I found this on the web. Oops, sorry. Um, you know, I, I I I I love listening to speaker tapes. In fact, I was just listening to all of the um, speakers from the the roundup from Kingsport, Tennessee. I, you know, I, you know, when I was about nine months sober, I went to a convention in Houston, and Father Martin was the speaker, and he um, he was telling his story. He wasn't doing chalk talk. He was actually giving his own story. And one of the things he said is, "Good enough is the enemy of the very best." And what are you worth? Are you worth the very best? then if you are, then you need to work for it. And I believe that I can't, I can't, I have to give back to this program. I have to participate in this fellowship. Um, I can't be a casual observer. And I, I have, you know, like many of us who have been around for a long time, I've lost a lot of friends. My husband died of an overdose. Um, he just couldn't make it. Um, my sister got sober 
you know, my, my father didn't make it, but it's suicide. You know, my mother died of alcoholism um, right, right after my second anniversary. Um, and this disease wants me dead. I know that it won't come up in front of me and go, oh, have a drink. What it'll do is it'll chip away at me. It'll chip away at me. It'll chip away and say, nobody likes you. You know, you don't, you don't matter. I'm just all kinds of crazy things. And it will chip away at, at my emotional well-being in my mind. And I do believe the big book that says a time will come when no power on earth will keep you away from a drink or a drug. And I know that. That's the, I have a little bit of a fear that I'm going to get too sober, too cocky, too well, you know, too big for my britches. And alcoholism is going to come around and they are going, and it's going to, you know, take me back because that's what it wants. And as long as I stay involved in this program, um, then there's less chance of that happening. And I know God will keep me sober. I don't have any problem with the, you know, with the word God. It's, um, and I will tell you, amazing miracles have happened. I'm a, I'm a woman who got pregnant at 17 and had a child and had to go back and finish high school and never went, never had the opportunity to go to college. And yet, um, well, I did a little bit of college here and there, but, um, you know, I was, I got hired to be the head of a corporation, you know, somebody who gone, who taught at the Harvard Business School decided that, that I had the talent and the skills and he hired me to start a company for him and then made me president of that company. That wouldn't have happened. It would certainly wouldn't have happened if I was drinking, but I think that's how God works. You know, um, I just, if I keep my sobriety as the most important thing in my life, I don't put it on my list. It's not number one. It has to be the umbrella that, that carries the rest of my life. Cause you know, one goes to two and five goes to six and you know, my priorities change all the time, but I have a friend that I got sober with in Houston. Randy used to say, if I forget what I am, it doesn't matter who I am. And I believe that I am so grateful for the people who went before me, even the ones that, um, you know, I, I sponsor women and I, and I decided I hate newcomers sometimes <laughs> I hate, and, I, and, and I love them. And, and, but I have the privilege of being able to pass on my experience, strength, and hope. I have to remember that all I am is the, is, the, is the conduit and God does the doing. I cannot make anybody get sober. If I could have, I would have, you know, I would have gotten my husband sober, you know, but I can't make anybody pick up a drink and I can't make anybody get sober. You know, they have to want that. And I've had to want this program. Um, and uh, I just, I can't believe the miracles that have happened for me, the, the amount of you know, I've been through the process of the of the big book, you know, four or five times. I believe that I always have to go through it with somebody else because I will never be able to see myself for who I am. Um, I need the people in the program to to give me the feedback. And I believe that this woman that was in Houston, she was this tiny little thing, but she had the biggest booming voice. Her name was Barbara and she'd go baby them and bury them. And, and I believe that I have to be careful not to, um, not to try to baby people. And then I also have to be careful about not being too harsh because I can be, I can be a little abrupt at times. <laughs> and if you want to know an opinion, I've got an opinion about everything. <laughs> I am, I've never had a problem with having an opinion and they're not always right. And that's what I have to remember. You know, I need to remain humble. I need to remain teachable. And it doesn't matter how many years I've been sober. And I, you know, I always get emotional around my anniversary time when my anniversary is next week. And, um, and I just have to um, remember that it's, it is a day at a time. I am not immune to be picking up a drink. I have to stay close in this program. I have to remember that my sobriety comes from God. And then my job is to pass it on. I truly believe that if uh, my friend Wayne Gilbert used to say, he used to lead a Herman Hospital meeting on Tuesday night. And he'd say, how would it be if there was a big blackboard on the stage that said, we got ours, hope you get yours. You know, I have to remember to stay involved in this program. You know, too many people get a lot of sobriety and they walk away. And, um, and I also have to remember that I too am, um, I'm vulnerable to this. I, you know, I, I, I'm still getting better. That's what I, I thought I'd be a lot better by now, you know, 
but I'm 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 still a work in progress. I love this program. I'm I think I'm an AA snob. I like being with people in AA much better than anybody else. Um, and um, and I will be forever grateful for the fact that you guys and God gave me this program and gave me sobriety. So thank you. That's it for me.